I am absolutely delighted that she's been able to come to eBay today. Toni Haastrup is a graduate of the University of California, Davis. Um, she then moved to another continent, con continent to do her master's at the University of Cape Town, followed by a PhD from the University of Edinburgh. Tony's research spans um, broadly the fields of global governance and security. She's worked extensively on EU-Africa relations, um, including two um, very prominent books. One, a recent one, the Routledge Handbook on EU-Africa relations, which she co-edited, and uh, her PhD thesis, which um, led to a book on chartering transformation through, through security. EU-Africa relations. Uh, she's also worked extensively on feminist approaches to international security, uh, regional security institutions, so the EU and African Union, um, specifically looking at foreign policy practices including processes of change and gender dynamics and the implementation of the women, peace and security agenda. She's also worked on um, a wide range of other projects so including the long-term impact of COVID on academia, which was a very interesting article I also came across recently, the effects of um, Brexit also on gender in, in Europe, and another interesting recent piece on why mainstream international relations is blind to racism, so also exploring the role of race and colonialism in, uh, in world affairs. Tony has been very intensively uh, involved in different networks, um, among others on European foreign policy. policy. So she's been uh, contributing to a, um, a research network on gendering EU studies, has been a co-convener of this network, has until recently been a co-editor of the Journal of Common Market Studies, so the most prominent journal in EU studies. Uh, she's also an executive committee member of Women Also Know Stuff. Um, and she has provided expertise to the drafting of the Women, Peace and Security Humanitarian Action Compact and has worked with a different, uh, with a number of governments and inter international organizations like the World Bank, the European Union and the Canadian and Irish governments. Um, Tony, Absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you so much, and the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you for um, welcoming me on a Monday afternoon. <laughs> I'm sure you have better things to do. Um, so what I want to talk about today was this idea of uh, feminist foreign policy, which I'm sure a lot of you have been hearing a lot about uh, since 2014. And um, we know that a lot of EU member states have either adopted feminist foreign policy or are wanting to adopt feminist foreign policy. And in one case, one, the initiative of feminist foreign policy has just reversed their um, commitment to feminist foreign policy. Either way, we're talking about feminist foreign policy. Um, and indeed, in a, not just what we would term smaller member states like Sweden, but also uh, the Netherlands, France, and uh, Germany recently. It is by no means just a European uh, approach or newer European approach to foreign policy, but there's something um, interesting, I think, about the fact that a lot of European member states, European Union member states, are seeming to, seeming to go this way. Now, um, each of those member states tend to appeal to their own internal understandings of both foreign policy and feminism. So there is no single feminist foreign policy. However, there are sort of two themes that I think runs across the feminist foreign policies we see globally and indeed in Europe. One is that they make a significant commitment to existing global normative and policy frameworks like the Sustainable Development Goals and gender equality within that, uh, reducing inequalities and indeed um, uh, peace uh, institutions as well um, as the women peace and security agenda has been quite central to this uh, new, femi new feminist foreign policy practice. The second is an emphatic commitment to human rights and gender equality as the basis of foreign policy design and practice. In a sense this is a change from the ways in which we think about foreign policy which tends to emphasize state interest. So if we accept that the focus on these practices are feminist, um, then we can also look at the ways in which that feeds through from the member states to the EU level. And what we've seen at the EU level is that there is a lot of conversation about wanting to include uh, feminism and already including 
concepts and ideas um, that feminists have championed for years, for example, intersectionality. But also we see a political move by some, for example, in the European Parliament, the Greens have been very um, loud about wanting the European Union to have a feminist foreign policy. This move towards sort of feminism in foreign policy, I would say, is informed by both internal uh, drivers. So we can sort of think about communities of practice uh, in Brussels that um, are civil society think tanks and people who work within uh, Parliament uh, and the Commission, but also an external impetus for change, i.e. the pressures that are put on um, those EU partners on the sort of things that they should be paying attention to. And in particular, I've been quite interested in this idea of whether um, the EU, despite some of the normative claims that it makes, can be a just um, external relations actor. So we know that um, if we look in the literature, the European studies literature, there's this idea that the EU is a gender equal actor. It's part of the myth building of what the EU's identity is. And the things that have been sort of mapped onto this idea has been this drive towards full economic, political, and social equality, primarily for women, although that's expanded in recent years. So if we look at that, and we look at some of what the EU has done recently in external relations, in particular the fact that, for example, the European Union commits uh, over 500 million to eradicating, not just uh, um, decreasing, but eradicating gender-based violence globally with a particular focus on the global south through this um, spotlight initiative to be implemented by the United Nations, I think we might sort of say, well, it's true that the European Union is indeed taking feminism seriously in its foreign policy. But I think it's worth asking whether this more feminism in EU external relations actually provides a route towards a more just EU foreign policy. Because I would suggest that despite significant gains and the increased attention to various feminist principles, uh, this view of feminism as an entry point, yes, provides more room for inclusion, but can also be narrow in the sense that it doesn't necessarily guarantee or even move towards a systemic transformation of the structural systems of oppression, including patriarchy itself, sexism, and importantly, in terms of dealing with external partners, particularly in the global south, racism and coloniality. So feminist foreign policy for me, nevertheless, is an opportunity to think differently about those things that international actors do internally that justifies their external actions. Um, but also perhaps a way to think carefully about how the world is ordered and the extent to which we can break down existing present hegemonic power hierarchies and ultimately have an international relations that is driven by a feminist ethos. But what is that feminist ethos? We know that there are multiple feminisms. So a liberal feminist might, for example, be content with uh, representation increasing more women in the practices of international relations. I would say that is a good that we should all aim for, and it's important. And we see that in a lot of the campaigns that have happened recently, this tends to be a focus. But of course, when we look at the texts and uh, the speeches of those practitioners of foreign policy, there's a suggestion that this is not the only thing that they're concerned about. So if you look at the text of the more recent EU documents on gender equality, so for example, um, the strategic approach to women, peace and security from 2018, the gender equality policy of the European Union and the gender action plan which governs external relations, there are terms like intersectionality, there are terms like access, different types of oppressions, the importance of different identities, which would suggest a deeper, or at least a, a, an aspiration for a deeper understanding of feminism. But despite the claims to these types of context, concepts and these types of ideas, some of the work that I've been doing with colleagues um, in Bristol, University of Bristol and Newcastle University, which suggests that there seems to be some sort of confusion as to you know, what feminism are we doing today, particularly when you look at the EU level. 
Um, and part of the reason that is the case that I want to argue here is because that there hasn't been this kind of a tension between this drive towards feminism and the willingness to actually want to transform the system within which the EU thinks it can thrive. So the big question is, you know, can the EU be feminist? Can it be feminist when um, it relies on an identity of global foreign policies that invariably leans into the very hierarchies that the different feminist ideas that it tries to incorporate seeks to break down? And I make a broad argument that what the EU um, does in terms of feminist foreign, fe in terms of foreign policy despite um, this attention to gender equality, including in different programs, despite the incorporation of new feminist principles, is one that is still quite antithetical to the feminist ethos. And I do this by broadly engaging with critical feminisms that draw on post and decolonial feminisms, as well as uh, black and transnational feminism. Specifically, I want to argue, drawing on my work on the EU's engagement in Africa, that there is a clear tension between the ambition of a feminist ethic to understand, criticize, and correct, and the ambitions of foreign policy, including the EU's most lateral, late move to pragmatism and increased militarism as a result of embracing this idea of a new geopolitics. Uh, I think that the result uh, of this is that the sort of well-meaning calls for the European Union to adopt a feminist foreign policy actually risks co-opting uh, feminist narratives. Now, I want to say very clearly now that that's not to suggest that at every chance that the EU gets, it shouldn't adopt some of these feminist principles and shouldn't want to seek transformation, but to suggest that somehow there can be any policy device now that will be feminist, um, I suggest is perhaps a bit premature. Um, and I want to explore how. So then, what is feminist foreign policy? I've suggested that there is no singular definition. Uh, we know that, you know, um, feminist foreign policy states, particularly the European uh, Union states, tend to emphasize women's rights, gender equality, but that's not new, right? So I think it is worth thinking through if the EU is invested in that and it's talked about it for years as being part of this myth of what it is, why does it need that label feminist foreign policy? Why are we pushing towards feminist foreign policy? And it would be something that I would like to discuss later um, because from what I can decipher, there seems to be a different vision of what foreign policy can be and they, there are tensions, I guess, within the union itself. What is clear, however, from the institutional level is that when we do start thinking about gender and gender equality, women's rights, um, gender even more expansively beyond women, there tends to be a focus on programming. And so gender tends to be absent at the EU level from issues of security, which are seen as gender blind, diplomacy, defense and trade which I think is really interesting since, for example, France's entry into feminist foreign, foreign policy was a feminist diplomacy. It's still not clear to me exactly what that is. Um, and when you look at states like Canada, uh, trade features um, there as well. So whereas this shift, at least in discourse, I think is part of a wider discourse, the extent to which it can really be integrated into all dimensions of foreign policy remains to be seen. Yet, as I said, where we sort of see um, the articulations of these feminist ideas are in two main areas. So one is the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, which the European Union itself has committed to, and most, if not all, EU member states are also committed to. This is where you find a lot of programs that are really focusing on uh, gender equality, rights of LGBTQIA folks. But I find that it's really interesting, although perhaps not surprising if we look across um, all the global north countries that have feminist foreign policies, that feminist foreign policy tends to target the global north. So for example, 
France does not articulate a feminist diplomacy policy towards the United Kingdom, for example, because it seems as if there's no need to. So this zone of the North is seen as perhaps not quite perfect, but okay when it comes to gender equality. So we need to implement things outside um, of Europe, but a particular outside of Europe, the focus on the global south. It is therefore not a coincidence, for example, that the Spotlight Initiative, while I think very welcome because the eradication, of course, of gender-based violence is um, something I think we can all get behind and is a transnational fight. It's not surprising that it focuses on the global south even though we, we obviously, in this zone, uh, still have gender-based violence. Um, so <laughs> when we sort of look at um, the story of what it is that the EU is doing, it seems, OK, so yeah, things are not perfect, but we seem to be moving towards the right direction. But that only makes sense if we're looking at these gender equality programs. Can we really claim that we can have a feminist foreign policy with what we have when we look at those different dimensions as a set of foreign policy, diplomacy, security, defense, trade, among other things. I think, for my part, that where we have seen EU member states, and indeed those who are vying for a European feminist foreign policy, leverage feminism in foreign policy, they use it as a sort of legitimizing move for what the EU is and what the EU can be. And invariably then fall into what feminists have called um, this idea of the manly state. So for those of you who know the history of EU foreign policy, there's always been this idea that, you know, compared to its member states or, God forbid, compared to NATO, it's not really that much of a strong international relations actor. And it seems that for its entire existence, the EU has tried to move towards this um, space where it can be considered a legitimate um, sort of global actor, a legitimate security actor, for example. Of course, the running joke is that when Europeanists talk about the EU not having a lot of muscle, I always say, well, ask the Africans how they feel about that statement. And actually, this is why I return back to the work on Africa-EU relations. If the whole idea behind feminist foreign policy is to sort of help justify, legitimize the sort of actor, the sort of ethical um, actor the EU can be, what does that mean or what could that mean in practice for those spaces where the EU practices its foreign policy? I would say that the adoption of, of the feminist label without a consideration for power relations at the heart of the international system and at the heart of the ways in which the EU engages with the rest of the world, especially through the legacies of colonialism and the persistence of coloniality in the implementation of so-called feminist foreign policy poses a problem for us because it precludes any sort of transformation. I think in particular, when we zoom out of just those gender equality policies and external relations, we can begin to read another story emerge from this quote unquote move towards more feminism by actually applying a critical feminist lens that draws on post-colonial and decolonial. So, the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy um, argues that a feminist foreign policy is one that has the potential to be a mechanism for, of equality, justice, solidarity, and peace. In fact, they think any foreign policy could do that. It just doesn't. For a feminist one, this has to be essential. So they define, for example, feminist foreign policy not as one thing, but as a framework that is centered on the well-being of marginalized people and invokes processes of self-reflection regarding foreign policy's hierarchical global systems, which means a rethinking from the viewpoint of the most vulnerable. It should elevate women and marginalized groups, their experiences, help to articulate their agencies, scrutinize the destructive forces of patriarchy, colonization, heteronormativity, capitalism, racism, imperialism, and militarism. In effect, 
feminist foreign policy should interrogate the violence of the global systems of both political and economic power. Feminist foreign policy ought to be ethical. So the big question here is, can the European Union, despite what it can and can't do, can it do any or begin to do any of those things? Can it really break down heteronormativity? Can it seek to transform or destroy capitalism? Again, for anybody who knows the European Union, it, its basic identity is either market power or um, a liberal power or a civilian power that espouses liberalism. So I think that there has to be caution in the ways in which we think about what it is that the EU is and what it is that it can do. And here, I look at, um, as I said, Africa's relationship with the EU. Historically, this has not been equal relations. Um, most people know that. Um, it is one that I think a lot of the literature broadly agrees is an asymmetrical one. And I agree with that statement, but it's not just asymmetrical because, you know, Europeans, uh, I don't know, have more spending power than Africans, for example. But I've argued in other work that it's one that is um, reinforced by this idea of a coloniality of power that is imbued in a logic of racism, even in the name of peace and human rights. And it reifies problematic hierarchies and dominance without necessarily seeking to challenge them at all. And this doesn't just happen through the EU institutions or through the EU militaries. Think, for example, of NGOs, the sort of NGOs that work in uh, Africa. And of course, we know businesses as well. And it is in this context, this context where the EU seems to thrive, that it constructs its foreign policy practices and its relationship with the African continent and all 54 countries. What I think is really interesting as a sort of aside is that it is also difficult to sort of move out of this relationship because the founding of the European Union in a way is tied to this sort of relationship with Africa. And I think that kind of only reinforces my point. How do you get away from a, or how do you get to a feminist foreign policy when you can't get away from the structure of this relationship and you're not as invested as you might think in trying to get away from it? I think first that the hierarchical relationship frames the relationship is antithetical to feminist foreign policy. Each big summit between the African Union and the European Union tries to quote unquote reset the relationship. And one of the things I found really interesting, particularly in the last couple of you know, last three summits and the most recent one was last February is that in the context of these discussions even when we know that the European Union has already committed uh, funds um, and technical advice to gender programming for example gender equality barely features in the context of these big negotiations this is partly to do um, with the fact that I frankly African elites are not going to bring it up at all but if, again, Europe is supposed to be this zone of where everything is more or less cool and this is what we do every day, everywhere, you would expect that you can sneak it in every now and then. We don't find that at all um, in the context of um, engagement. Um, I think the second issue is that the relationship itself is situated within broader global political processes that are not willing to change. And, if anything, the EU wants to come out as a sort of leader within uh, the framework of global politics. So one of the things I found really interesting in some of the other work that we've been doing is that um, although perhaps the most resonant conceptualization of the European Union as an external relations actor is this idea of the EU as a normative uh, power, right? So having the ability to shape what's normal in the world that ability to shape what's normal in the world doesn't really provide any opening for the sorts of things that those who advocate for feminist foreign policy in the transformative sense want. Um, so I think while feminism can serve as a prop to pursue European interests abroad, again, this legitimizing move, without reflecting on the patterns of exclusion, feminism here then is grounded um, not a, in a...
project of emancipation or liberation, but one that is effectively mm -hmm. rendered meaningless. So is there a way forward? I think there are important possibilities of linking feminism and external relations or foreign policy. I think it forces all of us to consider both the racialized and gendered nature of global state structures, the international system itself, uh, the different policies that are attendant to the structures and the everyday politics of international relations. I think feminism demands justice. And I think as long as we're sort of thinking about feminism in relation to external relations or foreign policy, we might begin to think that justice is important for the practice of international politics. That, you know, race, class, sexuality, disability are not just things that we consign to social policy at a domestic level, but are intrinsic to international politics itself. At the same time, we know that it cannot be simply adding women and there that a lot of, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of what the EU has done in the field of gender equality has not been bad, but it was not necessarily feminist foreign policy. So if we want to see a change towards feminist foreign policy, it can't just be those things that um, don't necessarily change the status quo. I think feminism in foreign policy, making those links together might help us think about ways in which the European Union can achieve a just uh, foreign policy, um, where the idea here isn't that you know, member states are necessarily uniform in their approach to others. But at the same time, what it is that they do cannot undermine that ethics of feminism, uh, and in particular, the ways in which uh, they treat those abroad. So you might already think, well, we failed here because that, none of that is going to change um, anytime soon. But I think that in some of the work that have, have been done um, through a collaboration of colleagues in uh, academia and um, the third sector, that they've perhaps provided a way forward in which we can sort of think about feminist foreign policy as everyday international politics practice. The idea isn't to have a single po foreign policy. So we see again that there's more of a leaning into this idea that it can be a framework for action. And so in the work undertaken by Jessica Chong, uh, Dilek Gersel, Mary Krishna, and uh, Victoria Shire, they suggest that an advocate for feminism in foreign policy to be informed and built on the legacies of transnational activism critical theory, everyday practices of solidarity. That it has to be value based on five core values, intersectionality, empathetic reflexivity, substantive representation and participation, accountability, and an active peace commitment. I think these values are intended to create a framework or ethical checks for what it is that European actors do um, externally. So how would this work, for example, in the area I know best in Africa, EU relations? So when we're thinking about intersectionality, intersectionality, I should say, it's not about identities, although identities do come into it. It's about understanding the ways in which different structures of oppression interact uh, to disadvantage those of um, marginalized or non-hegemonic identities. That would mean, for example, then, that the European Union starts to pay attention to the needs of the most vulnerable and marginalized in Africa. As someone who's interested in African agency, I do want the European Union to pay attention to, not, to what African elites want and think, but also, also ex and perhaps acknowledge that some of what they articulate um, is what might be good for Africans in the context of global politics. But I think also going beyond that, thinking about those who are rendered vulnerable, even by those states and those elites that they engage with, will be important. The second uh, is the emph em empathetic reflexivity. To consider the impact of EU foreign policy actions <coughs> in a historical context and in relations to others and be attentive and responsive to the needs of those around them. And we can see actually within the European Union, countries who are thinking or have adapted feminist foreign policy starting to do this. 
Uh, at the same time, we can also see countries who've adopted feminist foreign policy who are very against doing any of this. So the first example would be, say, Germany. Finally, um, seeking a path uh, towards reconciliation with indigenous communities in Namibia, acknowledging the impact of German colonialism in that country. On the other hand, you've got France, who has actually declared a feminist diplomacy policy and is not willing to pay compensation to the victims of uh, nuclear testing in the Sahara. Another value, of course, is substantive representation. Um, as in the inclusion of individuals and peoples advocating for equality from diverse backgrounds. And in this context, so far, a lot of the EU's uh, foreign policy that looks at gender has very much been focused on women. We know that globally, women are marginalized. Unfortunately, this is still the case, even though technically there are more women in the world today than there are men. Um, but it's not just, I don't think feminism can just be about women, and it never has been. So again, if we're going to lean into the concepts and ideas of black feminists, who've always been very clear that it was about marginalization, then we need to think about indigenous peoples as a group. Um, uh, we need to think about the ways in which different types of people are racialized in different spaces, for example. Within Europe, traveler communities are significantly marginalized in almost every European Union country. And they are not considered with the within a lot of the frameworks of justice uh, and gender and feminism, but also especially LGBTQI people. Immigrants um, within the European Union context are often left um, outside this uh, frameworks of justice, which obviously then feeds into external relations practice. And we've seen that especially since 2015. We've seen that in the rhetoric of the high representative, um, for example. Uh, so if we have more of this sort of people who are often victimized and marginalized, being represented in um, decision-making spaces, the idea is that we might then begin to listen to um, the, the perspectives uh, and experiences of those communities. But I think one of the things that this particular dimension says to us is that, again, intersectionality matters. Uh, um, penultimate is accountability. I think that needs no explanation. In most foreign policy practices of global North countries, they're hardly ever accountable to anyone. The only sort of accountability you find is when we're looking at domestic uh, politics. So when I think of my own country, we've just, the, the prime minister has just sacked um, uh, the, the, the minister with our portfolio because he um, had dodgy, um, <laughs> uh, he had very dodgy um, tax affairs. I mean, it, it, it took a really long time to actually get it there, but we know that that can happen. But the same UK Parliament is also voting against being able to, for example, prosecute uh, soldiers who commit war crimes or investigate them, for that matter. Um, so we need accountability within global politics broadly. This is not a new demand, but if we are claiming feminist foreign policy, then it has to be an important one. And finally, active peace as the core commitment. This one is especially important, and I think very resonant in light of what's happening uh, in Europe and along our borders. It's one that is contentious, I think, especially with respect to uh, feminist movements right now. The EU has seen increased militarization as a way to sort of bolster its security credentials. But I think a lot of feminists um, wonder if this move towards increased militarization Number one, does it appeal to existing EU identity frames around the EU being a peace actor? And number two, what are the broader implications in the everyday? So of course, uh, to conclude very quickly, there are challenges of elite-led politics that make sometimes uh, achieving those emancipatory aims of feminism very difficult. At the same time, we know that progressive stakeholders have been successful in at least championing some of those feminist-informed feminist policy practices that I've um, mentioned. I think this has been clear. We've seen the evidence in the things like the Spotlight Initiative, like the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, and a lot of the work that is still being done around the Sustainable Development Goals.
Yet, by reflecting on the broader domain of external relations, especially in relation to Africa, as I've done here, but I think we can extend that, the aspiration of um, feminism and feminist foreign policy, as I've outlined here, cannot just be a basis for external relations just yet. Um, I think often one of the culprits um, of why that's not the case can be a pragmatic one, which is what we've often argued in EU external relations studies, that there's a lack of coherence in EU foreign policy anyway. So, you know, um, if uh, the delegations are doing something to further feminist foreign policy, that might not necessarily be the same outlook from headquarters. So, yes, it would be very nice that there is a sort of more practical effort that um, there's more coherence. Um, but if, again, if the sort of feminist ethos that has been described here is not the basis for that coherence, then it's just a public administration exercise. I think that, um, finally, perhaps, that the EU, as I said, although kind of usually projects itself as this sort of zone of peace, zone of every, the space where we got everything right, and stuff has to happen externally, it would actually be useful to go back to some of the promises or some of the aspirations articulated most recently in the 2020 um, gender equality strategy to sort of think about the ways in which actually the EU can learn from others and think about the ways in which we sort of, form, uh, sort of further this feminism-formed foreign policy and internal policy as uh, different practices of solidarity rather than something that the EU already gets right and is wanting uh, to export externally. So there is a pathway and there is a space for, and great, for greater inclusion of feminism actually in EU's external relations, but I think it's very premature to suggest that the EU can be a feminist foreign policy actor. Thank you. Tony, thank you so much for giving us all so much food for thought. So I'm happy to um, take any questions you might have. Aurora first, Vivian afterwards. Thank you very much for your talk. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is on uh, the legitimization that you were mentioning um, before and the, the, the fact that feminism can become a form of legitimization. And my question is on the rational. So um, I was wondering whether you have seen a transformation in the rational used uh, behind the, the feminism as, as part of foreign policy. And I'm thinking about processes that we have seen have been happening in member states with the rise of feminationalism. So the use of feminism, just to simplify, the use of feminism uh, to support nationalist and even Islamophobic discourses and practices. And the second question, um, I'm curious about your engagement with Africa. Well, we know Africa is a continent, so it's diverse, and we tend to see it as a thing, but it's not. <laughs> so um, I was just curious to know how these, uh, how African states are reacting to um, what could appear as a sort of like a neo neo-colonial, evangelic, almost civilizationalist engagement or uh, mission that the EU is, is, is conducting with this feminist foreign policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, could I also all ask you to briefly introduce yourself? So this was Aroma. I hope. Um, good morning, um, Dr. Hastrup. Thank you for your talk. I don't know if you can hear me. Well, I'm going to project my voice. Um, yeah, my question was, uh, it goes uh, very close to what she recently said. Um, I was wondering on the dichotomy between between feminism and colonialism. Uh, for example, uh, with the French, with Macron, um, instead of um, doing a summit of states uh, uh, in 2021, I think it was, he directly engaged with uh, civil society, which kind of breaches the, the hierarchies, um, right? So by um, implementing this foreign, uh, feminist foreign policy, um, there is also, as she said, um, kind of, um, imposition of values and ways of uh, living. And so I wanted to uh, know your opinion in that and yeah. That was Vivian. 
Oh yeah, the former former UBA student. <laughs> I now yeah. Um, hi, my name is Emre Amasila. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here. Sorry, what's your name? Emre Amasila. Emre. I'm yeah. a postdoctoral researcher at Ibe. My question was kind of similar. Uh, when we look at the critical feminist literature, particularly I'm thinking of Sabah Mahmoud's work, it seems to naturalize some of these patriarchal hierarchies that we see in the third world. So how does a vision of change in foreign policy use post-colonial critical theory to enact, to change the lives of these women? So that's one question. The second one is kind of related to this. A lot of Islamist regimes have adopted post-colonial discourse to legitimize their rule. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm particularly thinking of the AKP. You could think of the Islamist regime in Iran. Mm -hmm. So, you know, blaming colonialism, blaming these unequal ties to shield themselves against criticism. So how does this fit in with your vision of a feminist foreign policy? We'll, we'll pause here to give you the chance to reply to it. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so I'll start with uh, your, your first question. Um, what is re really interesting is when the states who are moving towards FFP, because I always go to this workshops where they're like, so now Germany's thinking about feminist foreign policy. Do you have something to say about it? And I'm like, Germany can't do feminist foreign policy. Good luck with that. Um, in a lot of those meetings, you get people who actually believe in feminism in the way that we want to believe feminism. They want transformation. Like, you know, they're well-intentioned. So you hardly ever get people who are like, um, we're doing this because we're just better. Like, look at what they're doing over there. So it's not about... Um, reverting back to this feminationalism, so to speak, right? Uh, which I find interesting in terms of the negotiations of what the feminist foreign policy is. But actually, when it comes to the implementation, it seems as if there's that embedded and not embedded assumption that, yeah, we actually, we are better at it because we are X, Y, Z. Although, interestingly, I would say members of European you know, member states leaning more to their European identity than necessarily a national one. So uh, German feminist, to be specific, feminist development policy is a continuation of German development policy, but is really based on broad European values rather than something that would be German specific. Um, so yes, the, the, the process of legitimization or rather um, rationalizing uh, feminist foreign policy tends to be quite progressive. Um, I, you know, since 20, I would say, you know, since around 2015, um, a lot of the conversations around feminist foreign policy has more people of color in the same space than the conferences I go to on Africa EU relations. That is how progressive. Um, it tends to be, but when you actually move it back into practice, I, I would say that isn't necessarily how it goes. Uh, in terms of engagement with Africa um, and perceptions of African states, I'm going to take that question together with similar questions that have been asked. So I think one of the reasons why I uh, mentioned elites is that, of course, elites in Africa um, reinscribe their own hierarchies in order to govern. Right. Uh, and part of the work that I've been doing on African agencies to suggest that, you know, when we when we're talking about African agency, we're not saying agency is necessarily innately good, but rather it should be acknowledged. Right. In the same way that the United States has agency, when we know that the U.S. is not necessarily a good actor, it is still allowed to act in international affairs, whereas we can't actually say the same uh, for African states. So, yes. Um, there are, there will be African states who might chafe at being asked to think about the broader implications of feminist foreign policy. But as I've said, in a lot of those spaces, they barely ever discuss feminist foreign policy. So the only people to discuss feminist foreign policy with are people in civil society, broadly defined, not just sort of formally organized civil society, but also representatives from different movements. Now, why is this important? Because actually, in the broader context of international relations, 
even we, we the knowledge makers of international relations, we who are critical, who employ critical feminisms, tend to write off those people as having agency in being able to articulate what it is that they want. My entry into feminism was African feminism, not any sort of European feminism. Uh, and now I know a lot about European feminism and there's a lot that I like about uh, different feminisms that have been theorized by Europeans as well uh, as, as North Americans. But I don't actually see a dichotomy for the emancipatory or liberatory world that I propose between what it is that African want, Africans want um, and some Europeans want. That is not to suggest that the states that act on our behalf don't want different things. I mean, they definitely do. Um, and in a sense, that's a, that's a constant battle, right? That, that, that's something that you have to um, push against. Um, I was thinking about the summit recently. Uh, and so it's really interesting because with what you just said, uh, someone, it was an article, I think, in Politico that was saying how, um, you know, Macron is really, um, uh, I think it was a, an ambassador was recalled back to Paris. And the article was suggesting that this is an example of how Macron is no longer seen as important in, in Africa, especially in uh, French speaking um, Africa. And one of the reasons that was given for that was uh, this summit. So on the one hand, as a European, you could read that summit as well. Good on Macron, he circumvented um, going back to the elites in Africa and, you know, the Africans didn't like that. Isn't that just colonialism again? And I, I would say probably, but it's the least of the problems because if you actually listen to what he said at that summit, that's your coloniality. I mean, he would have said the same thing or not even have said that at all. So he might not have said the same thing if he was engaging with um, African elites at that level. And would we consign that to have been a successful French Africa summit? So I don't think the fact that he circumvented um, the leaders in of itself was, to be honest, I don't think he thought that deeply about it. I think we're assuming a lot about our leaders globally in general, if you look at the news today. Uh, but I think it's more important to pay attention to the content of what was said in that particular um, space and the ways in which um, he he did he barely spoke about feminist foreign policy so he wasn't he wasn't seeking to proselytize why feminist feminism is good uh, it wasn't even I would say that was my point that you know despite everything that has been said about feminist diplomacy he was definitely not practicing any type of feminist diplomacy even though he didn't even have to deal with elites at this um, particular summit um, so i don't think he breached any hierarchy if anything he simply reinforced it um, vision of change in the lives and post-colonial discourses so i'll answer the second one because i think the first one is kind of answered um, when i answered a whole question uh, yes right so india's modi uses post-colonial discourse as a justification for a lot of stuff that is very, very, very bad. Um, there's nothing that I can personally do about that, or indeed the theorists of post-colonial um, post studies, because we all leverage theories uh, in different ways. Um, in my international relations modules, um, I often have to come to the defense of realism because of the ways in which realism has a bastardized. And if you'd asked me 15 years ago if that would be my life, I would have said no, because people use and misuse theories. Uh, every, almost every other conversation I have with Ian Manners is us trying to reclaim narrative power in Europe because people have said things that he never said should be said about normative part Europe. So, you know, I think concepts and themes like that are going to get away from us in the same way that intersectionality, right? You know, there are people who say intersectionality is everything now and they have no clue about it. And then there are people who are banning books in Florida because everything is critical race theory, right? So we're always going to get that. Um, but I think that if we, who, uh, if our understanding of a uh, post-colonial uh, theorizing post-colonial studies is one that is founded on this emancipation and liberatory ways of thinking. 
then we do have to challenge those claims as well, right? So yes, a uh, Iran claiming post-colonial whatever and is like killing women on the streets for not covering their hair doesn't make any sense. By the same token, I think we also cannot be scared to sort of say France insisting people should wear certain things is problematic and is, in fact, reifying a certain type of coloniality. Two things can be true at once, and to use an English colloquialism, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And that's kind of how I see um, a lot of this. But thank you so much for that particular question, actually. Perfect. We definitely have time for another round of questions. Who would like to go next? Robert. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the connection between the word feminism and foreign policy in terms of if we think through critical feminist lenses about what it is to be foreign, we often think about it's the alternative from the domestic. It is the place where you would find perhaps more violence or it's more less control. And in, in terms of binaries of gendered identities, the domestic is that which is peaceful and womanly and that which is masculinized is the external. So is on one question would be, to what extent does the, um, the, the feminist component of foreign policy have to have an interaction with each other? Or would you even say that in certain critical perspectives, to have a truly <coughs> feminized foreign policy, you need to remove the term foreign policy and replace it with something else, be it global politics, or as you towards the end spoke about was external relations, which for a long time in EU studies was um, this alternative non-state framing of what it was the EU did beyond its borders. Yeah. Tony, would you like to respond directly? Yes, um, that's a really good question, which goes to the heart of my broader take around foreign policy and feminist foreign policy is that I think for feminist foreign policy to exist, there can be no foreign policy and therefore no feminist foreign policy, which is like really mind bending. But you know, that's my cop out answer. But going to um, sort of discursively, I guess, and in terms of practice. The reason I like the framework proposed by Chang et al. is that it does target different areas that we accept is foreign policy. Um, and if, you know, if we define foreign policy or external relations, whatever you choose to call it as, you know, yeah, we live in a system that is still very much a state system. We should do something about the ways in which we think about borders, but Largely, there are people in other places who think about other things, right? So if we go back to um, Buzan et al's ideas of different regions, even if you just want to take it from there, that, you know, there are different regions that we have to engage with, and they have their own sort of cultures, their own ideas. Um, and we have these historical relationships that are still not, uh, they're still quite fraught. But we want to still be able to engage with others. Um, according to sort of the most recent, the big German um, declaration of the last few days has been its Africa strategy, where it says that you know Africa is um, essential to Europe's future, and this is why Germany is doing this, right? So you know some people can sort of look at that and sort of think, okay, solidarity, uh, but Germany you know, is not Burkina Faso, and Burkina Faso is not Germany, so they still have to find a way of engaging with each other. And if we sort of call that space what is foreign, not like stick to the traditional idea of what's foreign, then feminism can go along with foreign policy, but change the ways in which historically these two sides may have dealt with each other. But I do think that, you know, if, if we sort of think about feminist foreign policy as an aspiration, the end product is we no longer have foreign policy because we're all at peace with each other, which I'm, yeah, I'm not that optimistic, but there you go. <laughs> Hi, Tony. Hi. I really enjoyed that, thank you. So I have a question from a slightly different perspective. 
So institutions and policies, mm -hmm. they're always sticky, aren't they? They're yep. always resistant to change. They're always embedded in, in something that is, is very, very difficult to shift. So if you were to come in and told us that EU foreign policy was feminist, mm -hmm. I think we'd have all been really surprised. So, you know, it, it isn't, mm -hmm. and it isn't for all the reasons that you've laid out, and it, and it isn't just not feminist, as you say, it's embedded in colonialism, imperialism, civilizationist visions. It's, it's, it's got all sorts of baggage going with it. So it's not a surprise mm -hmm. that we haven't got a feminist EU foreign policy or set of EU external relations or whatever we want to call them. But what I'm interested in or would be really interested in is having some hope mm -hmm. that things might change. So what I'd really like to know is are there actors pushing for change? What, what kind of leverage do they have to enforce change? What kind of reception are they getting? Is it just co-optation? Or is there some kind of shift, really, in terms of kind of normative or materialist leadership for changing the framework? So that's my question. I take one more. Yeah, and I think there's another one out, out here. So, hello, thank you for the talk. Uh, my name is Carlos. I'm a PhD student from the communication program here in Pompeu Fabra. And I'm currently on my first year trying to frame my research on how uh, the decolonial approach may have an application to communication tools in the field of development, mm -hmm. uh, precisely because of how development is built around these uh, principles that sometimes ignore uh, how it was conceived and how historically there have been uh, things that uh, replicate the oppression. Mm -hmm. So my question is, if if you have, if you could maybe delve a little bit more into, or if you have any successful successful cases of how uh, of any foreign policy that has successfully applied the knowledge of the third sector to try and dissipate this oppression or if it's something that it's still being built mm. upon. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Hastrup. Um, in the line of the almost last question, for me, there's like this lack of perspective on masculinities. Mm -hmm. and, and this is one of the things that when we see gender as going beyond woman, we also have to see what's the role of, my, of men as mm -hmm. resistance or contesting actors within this feminist foreign policy. And this is something that maybe I would like to have a little bit of your perspective on this topic. Because it's something that I think it's lacking, and especially, for example, in, a sp in the Spanish feminist foreign policy, it's something that is completely out of the picture. Even if we speak about inter uh, inter intersectionality, male are always absent, mm -hmm. and it's seen as neutral. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know a little bit about this from your mm -hmm. perspective. Thank you. Right, OK. Um, I'm going to try to see if Okay, right, institutions. <laughs> um, thank you for taking me back to my roots there. Um, okay, so what I want to say is that you can view the inclusion of this sort of new feminist entries as a sort of layering um, of change. You're right that institutions are very difficult to change, and this is a point that I've, you know, tended to make as well as to part of why we have a problem. But at this moment in time, there are ways in which EU external relations is changing. And the big question is, but why is it not changing to where I might want it in the feminist way? Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, this is the point I'm going to try to get to, that who is able to drive change within the EU in terms of external relations. Um, people like myself, but who talk about the ways in which the EU has to be more muscular are able to drive change. 
because we're in a moment and there are opportunities, exter exogenous factors, for example, the war at the borders that allows for that sort of change to happen. It doesn't mean that there aren't feminists or uh, femocrats, as institutionalists will call it, who are out with who are within the institution, both at the third sector level, but also within the institutions themselves. For example, in Parliament, there are lots of folks uh, in Parliament, in the Green Party, for example, uh, and the coalition that has the Green Party in it, who've really been advocating for why we need a feminist foreign policy. In my view, however, although they put out, a, so they commissioned a report to the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, which included all these different sort of ideas, the things that they still, um, they still propose is not one that really seeks transformation. So you still have the same problem. So the idea here isn't that we don't see gradual change, and we do. I mean, if, if there weren't people who were advocating for the EU to put 500 million into um, that, that is pretty significant. I cannot think of any other country or, or, or um, international organizations that sought to make that sort of commitment, then we wouldn't have had something like that. But I think that there's a tension within the EU in the external relations space about who, whose change is able to make it to the fore and how far some of those uh, femocrats are willing to change. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. Um, the extent to which knowledge of third sector. So I don't know, at least in, in the sort of last decade, decade and a half, that um, I guess the change we would see is the fact that we now have feminist foreign policies. That's very much driven by people in the third sector uh, when we're looking at external relations and that feeds into areas like development. So the fact that Initially, the discussion in Germany was around a feminist foreign policy for Germany. Um, after about three months of different discussions, that was changed to say that what Germany wanted was a feminist international development policy, going back to the Canadian feminist foreign policy 1.0, even though you know, um, Canada is now broadening its own out. So if you take that example, we do see it as one example of how third sector has been able to influence a change to sort of produce both the discourse and the, and the policy. Now, what that would then mean uh, in practice, we don't know yet because, you know, Germany has only just gotten into it. One of the things I'm doing uh, right now, Charlton, when I get back to my hotel, is I'm looking at the text of the new Africa strategy and seeing the ways in which feminist foreign policy feeds in if it does. Um, so again, but again, that only tells me about the discourse, not necessarily the practice. So we'll have to see what happens in the future. Um, I guess the other example I can use is that in, in, a, in the early 1990s, the third sector very much fed into the constitution of South Africa, which is considered one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. Um, and therefore, in theory, then influences um, Africa first foreign policy orientation, which um, really focuses on practicing Pan-Africanism. Um, how, the extent to which that we see that in the everyday, I think it's a completely different story, but certainly in, in terms of processes, we've seen that um, coming, linked together. Um, but can I suggest the work of Olivia Rutazibwa and Mira Sabranatam for um, getting into that. Uh, finally, masculinities. Uh, I think it, masculinities are very important, although I, you know, I'm not, I think masculinities are important and there are some folks who are talking about it expressly. I don't think that has to necessarily um, profile men because actually a lot of women enact masculinities and, you know, this is kind of the point in the area that I, I tend to work on uh, the most, which is security. Um, and a lot of the, you know, some of the folks who've been quite vocal uh, about feminist foreign policy, not in Europe to an extent, in Spain, but especially outside of Spain, have been men as well who um, talk about how, um, you know, 
men are still the ones who are mostly in positions of leadership, so they 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 need to espouse this as well. Um, but again, you know, I don't. I think the discussions around masculinity tends to happen more in academic circles. So uh, Hannah Mulhoff has done a lot of work on in militarism and masculinities in relation to recent EU external relations practices and how that sort of conf conflicts with um, feminism and the sort of feminist aspirations. But I think, yeah, they, you know, there cannot just be an assumption that, you know, if you're a woman and you want feminist foreign policy, then you're just, that's all good and you're about feminizing foreign policy or vice versa that there has to be. But I think part of the problem is that, you know, maybe we haven't, we haven't done a really good job uh, as academics of trying to uh, make masculinities and studies of masculinities colloquial, that it's still very much this discourse that we have within the ivory tower and, uh, you know, most people don't understand what it is that you're saying. And they think that when you talk about masculinities, it just means you hate men or something. Um, which is obviously not the case. Um, but yes, I mean, the only thing I can say is that you're right. We should talk more about masculinities. I think it's definitely embedded in there. Um, and uh, there are some folks who are engaging with it, mostly the folks who are doing stuff on um, querying women, peace, and security through so Jamie Hagen, Harry Mertinen. But yeah, not a lot as much as there should be, especially in relation to feminist foreign policy. Tony, thank you so much for coming and, and talking to us today, for coming all the way from Sterling. It's, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you to all of, all of you for joining us today. Um, yeah, well, in, enjoy the rest of your day and do join us for the next seminar next week as well. And uh, thanks again, Tony. Thank you. Thank you.